A teenage girl would manipulate two older men and mastermind a murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lori Waterman. Viewer discretion is advised. Lori Ann Waterman was born on April 16, 1956, in Tacoma, Washington. She graduated from Curtis High School in 1974, and by 1978, she was married to Carl Waterman, who would go by Doc. At that point, they actually will move to Craig, Alaska, and then they would have two children. Lori was described as someone who was always helping others. She was very compassionate. She put other people ahead of her own self. She was incredibly well-respected, and really nobody could say anything really bad about her. She was working in special education at a elementary school there in Alaska. She was a volunteer at her local church. She volunteered for the Girl Scouts. She was part of the PTA, and she also helped with coaching sports. She was a dedicated wife and mother. She was incredibly supportive and an inspiration to a lot of people. And she was very much involved in her kids' lives. She was described as being her children's biggest fan. Craig, Alaska is this tiny itty bitty little place uh, in Alaska, obviously. And it's like has a population of maybe a thousand or so people. It is this very quaint little town where everybody there knows everybody. And so if anything goes wrong or if there's rumors, like everyone knows about it. On Sunday, November 14th, 2004, a state trooper there in Alaska was given a call about a vehicle that was on fire. A hunter had found a van, a little minivan that was smoldering and still kind of on fire. And they think they see someone inside the van in the back seat. Firemen arrive, they put out the fire. And once the state troopers get there as well, they confirm there is in fact a human body in the back seat of the car, completely charred. And obviously this person is deceased. The van looked as if it was deliberately placed where it was because it was kind of in like these shrubs and this like bushy area. There was absolutely no evidence of a crash. The car wasn't actually damaged at all. And so it was very quickly determined that this van was deliberately set on fire obviously for the purpose of destroying evidence and hopefully destroying this body. There was no one in the driver's seat so they know that the person in the car obviously didn't put the car there and didn't set it on fire. That night, later that night, or early the next morning, a man named Doc Waterman, who was Lori's husband, calls police to report his wife missing because he had just gotten back from being out of town. He was actually in Juneau, Alaska, because there was a, like a board meeting for the Girl Scouts. He was a part of the board for the Girl Scouts. So he was 100% confirmed to be out of town. There was no doubt about his alibi. So at any rate, he calls to say his wife is missing and then their minivan is missing and once police hear that they go well we found a minivan on fire with the body inside and so once they have Lori's name they get her dental records they confirm that the body inside the car was that of Lori Waterman. So they know the husband didn't physically do this himself, but they had to look into the fact that maybe, just maybe, he hired someone to do it. So they look into his financials, they check his bank account, they check Lori's bank accounts, they check everything they can think of to see if he had maybe hired someone, they check his phone records to see if he's been making any calls. They found absolutely zero evidence that he paid anyone or called anyone or had any arrangements made with anyone. They couldn't find any evidence to show that he was involved in this and he was pretty quickly cleared of any wrongdoing. So then they ask about their two kids. Well, their oldest child, their son, actually was not even in the state. He was out of state, he was attending college and they confirm that. And there, so there was no way he had any involvement in it either. Their 16 year old daughter, Rochelle, was actually in Anchorage that same time frame because there was a volleyball tournament that she was a part of. So they know that uh, her husband, Doc, wasn't in town. Her son, their son Jeffrey was in a completely different state. Rochelle was in a different city in Alaska, confirmed to be at a volleyball tournament. So none of the three of them appeared to be suspects. 
at least directly involved in the murder at first. Police go to the Waterman's house because Doc Waterman and Rochelle, when they both got back home pretty much the same day, and that's when they noticed some things were weird at the house and that Lori wasn't there, and that's when they would call and report her missing. So when police get there to look at the house, they allege they haven't touched anything or moved anything. So they know that Lori had attended a Chamber of Commerce dinner the night that she would have likely disappeared or had been killed. And they know she got home from that because the clothing she was wearing based on witnesses who were there was at the house in the hamper or something like that. They also saw photos of this dinner also at the house. So they know for a fact that Lori was home that night. One big thing they found that was very strange was that there was a bottle of wine that was like half empty there on the counter, which her husband and daughter was like, that's bizarre because Lori didn't drink. She didn't drink a drop of alcohol ever. And so that was like a big red flag of someone else being in the house. They also found a shoe impression on a windowsill. They found the tip of a rubber glove and fibers from a synthetic rope inside the master bedroom. So it appeared to them, this was pretty clear cut, someone broke into the house, someone abducted Lori Waterman, and then killed her. So who was that person? Why was this done? Because nothing was stolen from the home. This wasn't a robbery. Everything was basically there. So this had to be something else. They were hearing some rumors and rumblings around this town because again, it's a small town that their 16 year old daughter, Rochelle, in the past year or so, her appearance and her life appeared to have changed drastically. She went from being like this kind of sweet, innocent, you know, well-dressed girl. And they said she started to dress up in dark clothing and kind of almost turning goth, kind of. And she began to interact with older men. In particular, she was hanging out with two men. One of them was named Brian Riddell, and the other was Jason... Okay. The other was Jason Arendt, th this guy. Jason and Brian, both of them were 25. Both of them had been friends since they were kids. Jason Arendt was considered kind of a lost cause type person. He was considered a burnout and he wasn't doing anything with his life. Brian Riddell, he worked at a computer store. So Rochelle got a job at the computer store that Riddell worked at uh, sometime prior to all of this happening. And that's how she met the two of them. And through him, she met Jason Arendt. They started doing things like playing Dungeons and Dragons together. They were hanging out all the time. It was kind of strange. The 16 year old girl hanging out with these two 25 year olds. And apparently she started to date Jason Arendt. That's a... Uh, Okay, a lot of things wrong with that. Her family began, they found out that she was dating this older guy and they were like, what are you doing? You can't be doing this. She began to rebel. She began talking back to her parents. She became kind of a problem child. When they interviewed Brian Riddell, he said, well, I was with Jason Aarons the night of this murder taking place. And we were over uh, at one of our homes. We were watching the movie, The Princess Bride. We were watching it on a loop, basically. It's a strange thing, but okay. But Jason Aaron said, we were, yeah, me and Brian were hanging out, but he said something about they separated that night and they went to their own homes and slept, which was actually a different story than what Brian Riddell had told them. So their stories were conflicting one another. The day after they interviewed Jason Aaron, Jason Aaron calls police and says, I was just attacked by a man in the parking lot. See, I have, I have an injury to my neck. The thing is, is nobody saw this man. Nobody heard this altercation and the little injury he had on his neck was clearly self-inflicted. But he said that the man who attacked him, who he didn't see his face, said, stay away from Rochelle or else. He was trying to make it look like maybe that this other mysterious person, maybe he was the one to kill uh, Lori Waterman. But police, they just weren't buying the story. It just was, it was nonsense to them. He was clearly trying to deflect and put blame on some mysterious individual. So when Jason Arendt is confronted by police about, we think the story you just told us is fake, you weren't attacked, he says, yeah, he made it up. And then he cracks. He said, Brian Riddell killed Lori Waterman. 
And he did it because Rochelle told us that Lori was abusing her physically, that she had hit Rochelle with a baseball bat one time. And this was, she was living in a nightmare. Rochelle says she was just constantly being attacked and abused by Lori. When everyone else heard this, people were like, are you insane? Lori Waterman was like the gentlest, nicest, kindest person. Nobody could corroborate this, this story about how she was being abusive towards Rochelle. But Rochelle had a blog that she was also writing this in. Like, you know, I'm being abused and I'm a horrible mom. So Jason Arendt said he would wear a wire and try to get Brian Riddell to talk about the murder. And so that's what happened. Uh, Brian Riddell on, on this wiretap uh, was heard saying, making some kind of assertions about his involvement in the murder, but he didn't directly say, yeah, I killed her on this wire. So Riddell was then confronted by police about this. And he said, yep, okay, fine. I killed her, but Jason Arendt was also incredibly involved in the murder. He told police, we did this because we thought we were saving Rochelle's life. Rochelle said her life was in danger. She was being physically attacked by her mom. We needed to get her out of that house and we needed to stop Lori once and for all. So they thought they were being heroes to this 16 year old child. And what he said next was, Rochelle asked us to kill her mom. We did it to save her because that's what Rochelle wanted us to do. Rochelle was gonna be out of town, so it wouldn't look like she did it. And then me and Jason were gonna break into the home, kidnap her and kill her. So Brian Riddell says they broke into the home through the window, which confirms with the shoe impression. They abducted her, tied her up with rope. They then forced Lori Waterman to drink as much wine as they could get her to drink to make her intoxicated because their plan was to simulate a car crash in the van to make it look like she was drunk and she got into an accident. And what they were going to do was they were gonna drive her to the location where the van was found and they were going to snap her neck to make it look like again, that she got into a car accident and it broke her neck. But they didn't, they couldn't do it. So for some reason they were having a hard time breaking her neck because she was struggling and she was fighting against them. So ultimately what they did was they strangled her to death and now they know, well, now it's not gonna show that she had any injuries from this. And so they put her in the back seat and then set the van on fire. It was an incredibly gruesome and brutal attack on this innocent woman. So Brian Riddell was arrested and charged with murder on November 18th, 2004. Jason Arendt was brought back in for questioning. They confronted him again with, listen, we know you had more involvement and he confesses how involved he actually was. And there was only, he confessed to being way more involved in it, in the murder and everything. And so he was arrested and charged with the murder. He also tells police that it was Rochelle that asked us to kill her mom, that this was a planned thing. Rochelle planned it. This was, and they confer, he just confirmed it doubly from what Brian Rodell said. Rochelle was the mastermind of this whole thing. Rochelle was brought in for questioning. They asked her, listen, do you want your dad in here? She said, nope, I waived that right. She doesn't want a lawyer. It's all on the audio and all in video. And at first she's kind of denying it. She's kind of like playing dumb. She said, once confronted with this, you know, these stories that would be what they've told them, she goes, I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't ask them to kill her. I actually told them, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't kill my mom. And then she was like kind of a dick in the interview. Like she became, she clearly had no, she was not emotional about this at all. She was very flippant. She was almost combative at times. She just didn't seem to have any emotion whatsoever about her murdered mom. And then in the interview, she tells them the story again about, oh yeah, she hit me with the baseball bat and she pushed me down the stairs and she abused me and she just... Ugh, it was just, it was a nightmare living with Lori. And that the two men had offered to kill Lori to get rid of her to save Rochelle. And Rochelle said, no, I'm not, I don't want you to kill her. That's what she was saying. But after hours more of interviewing her, she finally just says, okay, I lied about the abuse. It never happened. She never hit me with a bat. She never pushed me down the stairs. She never did any of that. I lied. <laughs> and then she said to them, 
My whole family is going to hate me. No shit. When you orchestrate the murder of your mom, yeah, people are bound to hate you. So Rochelle Waterman was then arrested and charged with her connections to the murder of her own mom. In June of 2005, Brian Riddell pled guilty to the murder and he received a 99-year prison sentence. Jason Arendt, who claims he did not commit the physical act of the murder, which they had no proof that he did, but he was there when it occurred. He was there and helped with disposing of the body. He was there when she was kidnapped, so he was he was part of this murder. He was convicted of his involvement and he just got 50 years for his involvement. Rochelle goes on trial for conspiracy to commit murder and other charges in 2006, and that trial actually ends in a hung jury, and so a mistrial is called. It wouldn't be until 2011 when there was another trial for her and she was convicted, but only convicted of criminally negligent homicide. She was given a grand total of three years. That is it. Three years in prison, which she served and has since been released. She is out there. Maybe you see this video, huh, Rochelle? You're a piece of shit and you're a monster. I'm going to say that right now. I don't care. You orchestrated the murder of your mom. You are the reason why your mom was murdered. You. you. She lied. She manipulated those two men. First of all, they're shitty men anyway. And she got them to kill her mom. She planned it. And she got three years for that. That's bullshit. I don't care if she was a minor at the time. And ugh, she doesn't know it. Bullshit. Like... She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew precisely what she was doing. She knew how to manipulate those two men. She was more adult than those two men were. Honestly, she's a monster and she's out there now in the world. And that's, that's, that's terrible. I just, it's, ugh. But the two people who were physically involved in the murder, thankfully they are in prison and one of them will never ever get out. And the other one will get out at some points, but will be very old when he does. So even though the one who started this and orchestrated this got a slap on the wrist and now gets to walk around smugly and freely out there in the world, I could say that in some way, at least, Lori Waterman did get most of the justice that she rightfully deserved. But... That is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe if you are into true crime. I tell stories basically every day at this point. I also tell short form true crime stories over on two TikTok pages. Those are both linked in the link tree in the description of this video below. You will also find my merch store in that link tree. Uh, we sell t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. We ship all over this wonderful planet. So check it out if you like. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email with the name of the person or the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to the list. The list is humongous. I pick my cases at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But that is it for this video, True Crime Maruni. So we will see you for the next time, next video, next case. So ta-ta for now, True Crime Aruni. Mm-hmm.